So good evening. My name is Philip, and I'm going to be talking tonight about community building for tech. So we're going to go through tonight. We're going to talk about basically the story of OpenLate, how it was built, the changes it went through, and then along the way and more at the end, we're going to talk about some of the lessons we learned about community building, and then at the end, we'll have the epilogue. So kind of a recap, in case you haven't looked around, you are at OpenLate, and this is about OpenLate. So OpenLate is a bi-weekly tech talk series at OpenDNS. If you're unfamiliar with it or not a member of it, you can go to engineering.opendns.com slash OpenLate to learn more. So the basic idea behind it is that we do tech talks every two weeks that focus on relevant, relevant topics in technology. And we bring in really cool speakers to talk about something that they're passionate about. And currently, we're running open late, not just in San Francisco, but also at our Vancouver office. And the fun part about it for OpenDNS as our company meetup is it's an opportunity to share our engineering culture. So here are some stats about OpenLate since it started in like February 2014. So it's been operating about 19 months. And between our San Francisco and Vancouver meetups, we have a total of over 2,700 members. And between our two offices, we've hosted about 50 events. And the interesting thing is that about 10% of OpenDNS's technical hires so far this year have come through OpenLate. So I mentioned that we do tech talks. Here are some logos for companies that have spoken in the past. Uh, it's really been a privilege to be able to have such innovative companies working on such cool technologies and libraries and programs and solutions to problems come forward and then share that knowledge with everyone here. But first, how did OpenLate start? So here's the basic story. If you look at this map, this is a Yelp search for coffee shops that are open at just 9 p.m. in Soma and have Wi-Fi. As you can see, there's very few. In fact, number four right there is actually a wine bar. It's only a coffee shop during the day, so that doesn't really count. 10 all the way over there, I think, is a Starbucks. And then basically, like the closest one is Workshop Cafe, which is like a 20-minute walk from here, maybe more. So Soma is the like, technology hub of the city. And yet, there's no place that us nocturnal programmers can go to work in the evening. Like at 9 PM, nothing is even open. So OpenLate started as an idea of, well, nowhere here is actually open late, but everyone has offices. So let's just all hang out at one office, get some pizza, have some beer, and just code together. So that was the start of OpenLate. So we said, how should we do this? And we decided we'd just start a meetup. So OpenLate started as a meetup with the idea being that from 6 PM until midnight, you could come to the OpenDNS office, hang out, code on whatever you wanted, use our Wi-Fi. We'd order some pizza, and it would be fun. So this was a picture of our first meetup back in February 2014. It took place in the old kitchen that's now a training room, I think, right now. And we had a bunch of people show up, just pull out their laptops, and start coding. It was fun. The first few meetups were great. But we found out pretty quickly that hosting an event from like 6 PM until midnight got pretty exhausting. So just to take a step back and say, like, what have we learned from the beginning here? We used meetup.com to organize these events. And it's turned out to be a great piece of software. You know, Over a year and a half later, we're still using it. Uh, but it does have some downsides. So on the plus side, Meetup is kind of a social network in and of itself. And when you create a page on it, you have your page blasted out to all the members. It costs like, very little money. But when you're using it, you start the Meetup, and you have like 100 members instantly, which is really cool. In fact, you'll find that they help you kick off your Meetup so well that your first Meetup is better attended than like the three or four that follow. And it takes you a little bit of time to build that momentum and continue growth naturally. But if you go to the Meetup homepage, you can see all the Meetups that are happening near you, which kind of creates this basic network effect. And you'll continue to get traffic and new members just naturally as long as you're hosting events. And if you're hosting events, getting people to the events is your main goal, so it works really well. And the other thing it lets you do is send email updates. But it's worth pointing out that there are some negatives. The software is pretty dated. The iPhone app is almost non-functional. And it's pretty hard to use. But the biggest one for me that's bad is that you don't get access to the email addresses of everybody that participates. So you have no portability if you want to switch, soft, uh, switch software platforms. 
In the future, if I were to do this again, I would probably still stick with Meetup, but it would probably be worth setting up like an Envoy check-in iPad at the front to have people sign in and collect their email addresses. So that would be my advice if you're looking to set up something like this, is be able to create some kind of portability so that you can uh, really control the communication however you want. So after the first couple meetups, Andrew came to join me. Andrew had been an intern here, and he came in and decided to co-run Open Late with me. So we had a lot of fun. But the kind of secret we never told anyone is that we did the exact same thing in college. We started a speaker series in college, used to bring in cool speakers. And here's a picture of us with Alexis Ohanian, who founded Reddit. We brought him to our university. And this is something we had done together in the past, so it was pretty natural for us. And it was fun to be able to take some of that experience and bring it here to start Open Light. So we started to grow. We originally were in the kitchen in the old office, but we quickly outgrew that because there were only like two tables that held like maybe 30 people max. And so we ended up moving into the basement of our office because we didn't have any bigger space. And so that kind of brought this really cool late night vibe because it was in a basement, it was dark, and it kind of felt like it was open late. And one of the things we decided to do when we were hosting these initial just like open hack nights was get some themes. So the original idea behind Open Late was, you know, just leave everyone coding, like try not to disturb them, try not to have any structure, just make it like a coffee shop or something. But uh, you know, we kind of wanted to bring some excitement into that. So here we have some pictures from some different themed nights we had. One moment, I think Flux is on, so I'm going to disable that because I think everything is turning red. There we go. All right, prepare to be blinded. Uh, it's blue. Better? Kind of. So here are some different themes nights that we had. Uh, on the left is Andrew with our JavaScript night. We ordered these awesome JavaScript cakes, which were a lot of fun. Uh, in the top right, we had our Python night. And we had one of our first speakers, who was Zed Shaw. He wrote, Learn Python the Hard Way. So he came in and gave a great tech talk about how to learn code. And then in the bottom right, we did a sticker meetup one night. So we custom ordered our first open light stickers. We have some sitting out here if you want any for your laptop. But we also encouraged everyone to bring in stickers from their company. And I still have like a stack this tall of stickers in my drawer from that day and other days that followed. So those were the beginning of kind of creating a theme to these nights and some organization. Uh, but we had like, some learning that happened in there, too. One of the big learning nights is we decided to do a pitch night. And we said this, you know, we had a great JavaScript night, a great Python night. But let's try to bring in some like, venture capitalists and encourage like, the startup mood here and learn a little bit. And that was actually a really bad night in terms of organization, because the attempt at having this theme with interesting people and mixing that with our kind of lackadaisical approach to organization, making sure everyone could just hang out for six hours, didn't go that well. Because we had people that came and said they wanted to see these people speak, meet them. And we had some really cool, experienced people, but they were just kind of floating around. And that lack of organization really made us step back and think. Because we had this idea in our heads that we wanted to just have this relaxed meetup. But that wasn't scaling, and it wasn't going to work too much, or it wasn't working well for us. So we kind of learned this lesson then. The original idea of Open Light wasn't working that well as so we were trying to grow it. And so we decided that it was really good to have a theme, but it also needed to have structure too, so that there was something that, uh, where people could meet each other. And if we brought in cool speakers or had a great theme, they could enjoy that more fully. So shortly after the start of Open Light and a few events, we looked back at this failed night of VC pitches. And we looked at what made Open Light great. And our favorite nights were the speakers that we had. So on the left, we have Pete Hunt. He gave one of the first Open Light talks. That was an intro to React.js, of which he was the primary author at Facebook. And on the right, that was Zed Shaw, who I already mentioned. And we said, these tech talks are really cool. People really enjoy them. And we can still create this fun like late night atmosphere. So maybe we should just become a tech talk program. 
And that's kind of the open light that you know today. We bring in these interesting speakers every two weeks, and that's the main focus of the event, but there's still time before and after to hang out, code, and meet other people. So that's officially when Open Lights became the Tech Talk series that it is today. So taking a step back, one of the key things about starting a meetup is looking at growth. It's kind of like a mini startup within the company where you need to focus on brands, on whether your users are happy, uh, creating content, and growing it. So I'll share one of the growth hacks we used to get Open, open Lights to its current size. And one of them was cross-listing events. So when we hosted these theme nights, we'd reach out to other meetups in the area that had similar themes and ask if they would cross-list the events. And with that, there was always a link back to our meetup. And on the good nights, we could maybe get 100 people for an event to join from another meetup. Uh, we actually found out pretty early that meetup had a functionality a long time ago, by default turned on, where if your members created an event in the meetup, and it reached a certain size, it would email everybody within the group. So sometimes we would go in, create our own event, upvote it ourselves, and then force an email out to thousands of members of these meetups that you know, was relevant to them, but we got a couple angry emails from organizers that didn't realize that was happening. But moving towards the future, cross-listing is still a helpful way to get the appropriate audience for a tech talk, particularly for a meetup like Open Late where the theme changes every two weeks. In addition, in 2014, we went international. So this is when our office in Canada saw the growth of Open Light and thought that it would be really cool to replicate it up there, particularly because we had some engineers come down here from our Canadian office that thought it was fun. So in 2014, we also launched Open Light Canada Today, there are almost 900 members and host really active meetups there. And one of the interesting things we've learned from it is even though the number of members is less than half of that of the San Francisco meetup, they actually have extremely high attendance at the meetups because there isn't a vibrant tech scene in Vancouver. And they're finding that they're actually starting to create that community there and provide some organization to it. So even if you're not in San Francisco where tech is everywhere on every corner, there's still the potential to have a really successful meetup because that may mean that there's a lot of opportunity and not a lot else organizing, being organized in the tech community. And then finally, at the end of 2014, we moved into this space, our uh, beautiful 135 Bluxum space, and that really allowed us to continue growing the meetup because we were running out of space in the basement. Uh, during a couple of the evenings, we were carrying chairs down into the basement and people were sitting on the floor in the corner, and that wasn't fun, particularly in a basement. So now here we have room for about 200 people and we have filled the space. And after one year, almost exactly to the day, we hit 1,000 members in our San Francisco meetup group, which was an amazing milestone and we were really excited about it. And then moving into 2015, just looking at what made the meetup successful and how do we continue to grow it. And like I said, it's similar to a startup. You just have to keep chugging along and uh, we eventually had what was our most attended event ever, Lift Line. So we had Tim Brown, who was then the engineering lead on the Lift Line team, is now the engineering manager, and he gave an amazing talk about the algorithms behind pricing and tra dynamic traveling salesman problems that Lift uses to power what is one of the most popular features on their service. And you can see here in the photo, we had about 180 people show up. So the room was quite packed. I think that we had every seat filled plus like two extras that we had to bring out in the back to sit us, and then the rest was filled. So it was a great night. And so why was Lyft a really good speaker? Why were some of our speakers so extraordinarily popular? It's good to take a step back and look at what we've learned about what makes a good speaker. So in general, Open Late is like the OpenDNS meetup. So we try to keep most of the talks external. It's our meetup, but it's more the things we want to go to. So we try to make sure that we bring in a diverse group of speakers from different companies, different interests, so that the talks are interesting to go to. We found that a talk of 30 to 45 minutes is best. We have had shorter, they've been successful. Uh, we had a professor speak for two hours once, that got a little bit long. Uh, so 30 to 45 minutes tends to be about the prime spot. And what we found is that it's best to have someone focus on a really specific topic. So for instance, Jerome from Docker gave a talk about 
how Docker works in file systems in different operating systems. It was an extremely specific talk, but it was really popular because everyone who had interest in that general topic could learn really pointed information. So in terms of the takeaways that are good for a listener, we found that people really like open source projects. That's a great thing that everyone can learn from because there's the management side, there's the code side, and everyone can kind of peel back the covers and see how it actually works and participate in that. Another one that's good is a new way to approach different types of problems. For instance, the lift line talk. Everyone has used a lift and they see that it's a really cool application of technology, but being able to explain the novel approaches to that is a fun topic for the audience. And finally, just learning about the industry itself tends to be popular because there's a lot going on in technology and sometimes you don't know the specifics of how to use, for instance, a new database, but you're interested in kind of an overview. And so those are generally the topics that have worked really well for us. Uh, we generally try to avoid any type of like, sales-heavy talk. We try to avoid having like, a salesperson give the talk. Uh, the kind of gray zone between having like, a peer engineer and a salesperson give the talk is professional developer advocates. And so it's best to look, if you're looking at having a developer advocate come speak, at some of the previous content, because some of them tend to be fantastic, particularly companies that are based in open source software, have amazing developer advocates that give great talks, have in-depth knowledge. Uh, for instance, we had Francesc from Google give a talk about the Go programming language, and that was amazing. But if it's a developer advocate for a company that only publicizes an API or something, that may not be the best talk because it doesn't go into that much technical depth. So those are kind of the lessons we've learned about what it takes to find a good speaker, or about what makes a good speaker. So now let's look at how you find speakers for a tech talk meetup. In general, it's great to start internally and just asking everyone at the company because everyone at the company has a network and they know interesting people or people that are giving conference talks and that's the best way to start finding introductions. Uh, we've actually sourced some of our coolest speakers through Twitter. Uh, here we have a picture of Mark Otto and I think that we just tweeted at him and he said that he would come in. We found a lot of our speakers such as HashiCorp in that way and just like cold tweeting is a great way to find speakers, surprisingly effective. The other thing is that we are always talking about open lights and if you're meeting people at like a conference or something, it's a lot more relevant to people to talk about the cool meetups you have at your office than it is to like say, oh, by the way, like every other company we are hiring and if you're interested, you know, let us know. It's a lot more effective to say, you know, here's some of the meetups we have. It's fun to hang out at our office, check it out. And through that, we've sourced great speakers. I had a lift line with a couple guys and they ended up organizing an open light talk up at our Vancouver office. Just always be talking about it. If you're at conferences, it's a great way to source speakers. Uh, again, the co-hosting with another meetup is extremely effective because you get a joint audience, tends to be very popular, create a great atmosphere. And finally, a lot of people are about to present at conferences and want an opportunity to practice their talk and uh, make sure that the slides look good and you end up with what is new information that hasn't yet been presented to everybody by somebody who's put a lot of time and effort into the talks. So in general, if you find people that are about to give a conference talk and want to practice it, it makes for a great meetup. In terms of how we continued growth, uh, the, one of the more interesting things we've done this year is starting to record talks and we'll just post them on our website and let's, or, put them on YouTube and it's become a really cool way to take the open late atmosphere, the open late content and then amplify it out to the world. And you end up with a lot of traffic from like Hacker News and Reddit and very specific communities that find the information applicable to them. And the marginal effort from just having the event to also recording it and putting it online is very negligible, but you end up with such great inbound links and discussion about what's going on and some blog posts that are not like forced technical blog posts. They have a lot of like natural content to them. So in general, if you're hosting meetups and tech talks, it's a really cool idea to record them and put them online. In terms of the meetup kind of being a startup within the company, there are some keys to making sure that the growth is sustainable and that the company internally continues to help out and people continue to come and that's automating and automating more and automating even more. Uh, so on the right, we have a screenshot. It's the runbook for OpenLate. We have like a seven or eight page document 
that has everything that's needed to run the meetup, so don't even need to think. There's templates for emails, there's to-do lists for the day before, there's to-do lists for the morning of, to-do lists for the preceding hour, to-do lists for afterward. And that automation really means that it's easy for anyone to pick up the meetup and run it. That also means that it's easier for people to spin up a meetup at another city. And in terms of other ways we automate, having someone come in to clean up after the meetup relieves the burden of having to host it pretty often. Uh, knowing that the office management staff is automated, ordering pizza and things like that. And as long as you can make the meetup really easy to run by automating a lot of the steps, then you're able to keep it going and have more events. And that's you know, what would cause a meetup to die, is just not having events as often because it's a difficult thing to do and it's a burden. So in general, try to automate and remove the thinking between events so that you can focus on finding great speakers and putting on great events. So in retrospective, let's look at some of the other things we've learned from running OpenLate over the past year and a half. Uh, the goal of the meetup is basically building an audience. So one of the cores of that is trying to share the culture of the company that's hosting the tech community. You should never be trying to sell the technology behind it or trying to uh, make the topic of focus for the community a company. That just will ruin the meetup immediately. Instead, you should focus on the community and having fun. Uh, and the end results of that are fantastic for a company. Here on the right, we have some of the Twitter buzz from our Lyft Line event. And it creates this vibrancy to a company when you have this community. Everyone talks about it on social media. People know your name even uh, months after the meetup. If, and you end up with referrals. We end up with job referrals for people that came to a meetup and are not personally looking for a job, but think that their friends would enjoy the culture of the company. And if you are hosting the meetups, whether or not you're recording the talks, there's still great content for blogs. And that creates a lot of inbound traffic, which is fantastic for a company. So some of these results here may not be useful to someone who is running the meetup. But if you're looking at how to justify it internally and get the support of the company and funding for it, these should be the main things that you're talking about. And the end result is that you get to meet great people. And in the startup world, that means you also get to hire great people. But again, the purpose of the events are not to create a sales event. Every company in the Bay is hiring. And in general, you shouldn't have to be selling that your company is hiring. Everybody knows that everybody is hiring all the time. So the main goal of the meetups isn't to be a hiring event, but it's basically to take this great culture you, that every company has internally and let other people see it. And so that was kind of what Open Light started as, was not a hiring event. We don't treat it as a hiring event. Recruiters are not allowed to come to our events. But it's turned out to be a really great resource for the company because we find like-minded people. We built the events that we wanted to go to, opened them up to everybody, and we ended up meeting like-minded people and hiring great engineers and other members of our team. So in general, yes, the end goal and kind of benefit of creating a community is that it can help the company through hiring. But you're never going to achieve that if you try to create, if you set out to create a meetup for the purpose of hiring. If you just set out to go to, or create the meetup that you want to attend, you attract like-minded people. And if the circumstances are right and you keep up persistently, then you'll be able to hire great people for your team. So some final thoughts on setting up a tech community. I really enjoy the fact that we have a rhythm to our events. We are every other Tuesday. They're not sporadic. We know that it's every other Tuesday. And that makes it easier to, intern or to organize internally because everybody knows that every other Tuesday night there's going to be pizza in the kitchen and they can hang out. Uh, it also makes it easier to find speakers because you have set dates in the future. You know in December which days there are going to be meetups. And you don't have to email speakers and say, are you available at all over the next three months? You can say, do any of these six days work for you? And it creates a nice cadence and makes it a lot easier to organize. In addition, keep it quirky, keep it fun. Open Light pivoted into a tech talk because we were trying to make it quirky. And we always just try to look for new ways to make it interesting. Here are some mini cupcakes we made for the Lift Line talk, where we put the Lift mustache on the Open Light logo. And in general, try to create an independent brand. Like I mentioned, this isn't a recruiting event, so don't try to make it you know, your company's eponymous meetup. Instead, try to create your own identity, create your own stickers, and that will help to create a sense of community, even though there might be another company behind it funding it. 
And as most general wisdom, stickers are awesome, and you should have them for your meetup. And in general, keep it fun. As organizers, you need to make sure that you're continuing to build the meetups that you want to go to, because it's hard to run events. You know, most companies have event staffs, and they put on events professionally for sales purposes. And you'll find really quickly that it's because events are hard to run and kind of taxing. But as long as you keep it in the back of your head that these events are supposed to be fun and the ones that you want to attend, then you'll find it a lot easier to continue having them with this general you know, every two week schedule. So that is some of the lessons we've learned from hosting OpenLate here at OpenDNS. Uh, but kind of the purpose of this talk is that, like Eric mentioned, we've been working on OpenLate for the last year and a half, but unfortunately the time has come for me and Andrew to leave OpenDNS. Please continue to support OpenLate and send them to openlate at opendns.com. Always looking for new speakers, and if you're not here in San Francisco and want to look at the meetup, you can go to this URL here and join the Vancouver meetup, which is also a lot of fun. So these are the lessons we've learned from creating a tech community, growing it to two cities, over 2,700 people, and now I'm happy to take any questions you have.